Okay, well, tonight we're going to talk about G the night before Jesus' death. So, you know, everybody is more or less aware of the things that happen, you know, when Jesus is being crucified, you know, with Peter's denial and, you know, uh, the ripping out on the beard and the crown of thorns and the cross. Everybody's pretty, pretty familiar with those things. But I think oftentimes we kind of lose sight of two very important parts of Jesus' death. The, the first part is the day before he was resurrected. Everybody thought, oh, I guess we were wrong about this whole Jesus guy. <laughs> you know, there, there's a lot of doubt going on. There's a lot of fear going on because the guy that you were following for the past couple of years is dead. A very tragic time for the church. But another point that I think is, is really overlooked is, is, the day, is the night, I guess you could say, before, um, before Jesus' arrest and, and trial and all that. So that's what we're going to look at tonight. Now, it, if we stop and think, if we knew, most, most people, if they knew when Jesus was coming back, they would goof off and then just make sure that at that time they were ready, right? I mean, I don't have to be ready and diligent if he's not coming in my lifetime, right? I mean, most people think like that. Now, you know, obviously I'm not saying all of you, I'm, roll with me on this. I'm not trying to insult you guys. I'm just saying in our sinful nature, we have this in us that if we knew when our punishment was coming, then we just kind of goof off and do whatever until we had to straighten up. I mean, weren't we the ones skipping high school? I mean, come on. <laughs> and, uh, if we knew when a thief was coming, well, we wouldn't have to lock our doors every single time we went out of our house, right? We'd only lock it when we knew he was coming, and we'd be ready. We'd have a gun loaded or something, or have the cops on speed dial or something. You know, we, we would be ready and prepared. But that's the whole idea there is we don't know. If we knew, and now, now this is what, I'm getting, what I've been working towards here. If we knew when our trials were coming, we would prepare for it if we knew when the trial was coming. If we knew what trials we were going to face tomorrow, we'd be ready today. So if, okay, I know tomorrow morning, this and this is going to happen. It's going to be a huge ordeal. It's going to take a lot of time and patience to get through. Well, then I'm going to do everything I can right now to get ready for it. I mean, that's just smart, right? But the problem is that we don't know what awaits us. And so let's look at Peter. The night before uh, Jesus dies, and this is exactly what Peter was dealing with. I don't know if you guys remember, but there was a TV show called 24. You guys remember that show? Yeah. Okay. I was actually going to name this, uh, this little lesson 24 and have the, have the picture from the, from the TV. You know how they had like the, the little 24. <laughs> yeah, it's definitely, yeah. Uh, but then I thought, nah, you know, let's not, let's not push the whole Hollywood thing. So Matt, Matthew 26, 36 through 46. It says, then Jesus went with his disciples to a place called Gethsemane, and he said to them, sit here while I go over there and pray. He took Peter and two sons of Zebedee along with him, and he began to be sorrowful and troubled. Then he said to them, my soul is overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death. Stay here and keep watch with me. I'm sorry, it's skipping here. Hold on just a minute. There, sorry. Going a little farther, he fell with his face to the ground and prayed, My father, if it is possible, may this cup be taken from me. Yet not as I will, but as you will. Then he turned to his disciples and found them sleeping. Now, try and focus on Peter while I'm reading this, okay? Couldn't you men keep watch with me for one hour? He asked Peter. See, he didn't ask them. He asked Peter. Okay, now let's, let's keep going. Watch and pray so that you will not fall into temptation. The spirit is willing. Willing. But the flesh is weak. He went away a second time and prayed, My father, if it is not possible for this cup to be taken away unless I drink, unless I drink it, may your will be done. When he came back, he again found them sleeping because their eyes were heavy. So he left them and went away once more and prayed the third time, saying the same thing. Then he turned to the disciples and said to them, Are you still sleeping and resting? Look, the hour has come and the Son of Man is delivered into the hands of sinners. Rise, let us go. Here comes my betrayer. Now, we look back, right? We know what's about to happen. We know Judas is about to do the whole betrayal thing. But if you put yourself in, in Peter's shoes, this is a lot different. So, you know, you guys just had your little um, supper with Jesus, and now he's making you go out again. It's not really the way we do it here in Jerusalem. 
This isn't what we're supposed to be doing right now, Jesus. And then he separates the disciples into two groups, and he's, he's praying, and he's obviously bothered. And they're like, okay, so I guess I'll just sit here and wait. So the, have, have you ever left a kid alone for too long? They don't sit there for too long, do they? They, they come up with something to do. And I kind of feel like that the disciples are like the four-year-olds, you know. They're just sitting there, I don't know. <laughs> you know? <laughs> so, you know, looking back, we see how important this is, but Peter is not aware of this. And so then he doesn't know that Judas is about to do what Judas is about to do. We all know the name Judas. It's like a household name for a betrayer. Judas, you know, we use it in like a flippant kind of way. And so he sees one of the 12 walking up, and he's got to be thinking, what's going on here? You know what I mean? Like, it, if you put yourself in, in the, just like, what, what is the deal here? And then Jesus gets arrested, and you're like, what is going on? You know, so knowing that, and knowing that, that we realize the gravity of the situation, but, but, but Peter didn't, you have to realize that Peter didn't realize it was a time of change. He thought that in the morning, everything was going to go back to normal like it had for the past three years. What we do, and I'm putting us in the place of Peter here, we get lost in the boring waiting. We get lost in the, in the, in the times of, of patience when nothing is really happening, when God's trying to work character in us or, or whatever. Or maybe we call it uh, the times of plenty, the good times, the times of blessing. Nothing really is wrong. You know, things just kind of happen. It's like, okay, life is, life is good. You know, I'm not sick. My kids aren't sick. Everything's well. You know, and so we're in this place, of, hey, everything's kind of good. And we get lost in that same place that Peter was lost in. Tomorrow is just another day. Which brings us to a very core concept that Jesus, if you actually read through the Gospels and see what Jesus was saying in the Last Supper and, you know, to them in that part that I just read you, you kind of see this, this theme that Jesus is trying to get them to be alert. He's trying to get them to, you know, really pay attention and prepare them. So what happens in these times, though, is we get, first off, we get bored. Maybe we get bored of our walk with God. Maybe we just get bored of the whole church thing. Maybe we get bored of reading the Bible, whatever. We're trying to read it, and it's like, it, it's not that we don't, we're not consciously thinking, I don't want to get closer to God. But we're thinking, I'm so busy, I'm so tired, I don't really have time for this. It, what does it matter to me who lived 2,000 years ago? You know what I mean? And we get kind of in this rut of, we just get bored with it. Um, another thing is, we get distracted. Maybe, maybe we're on our phones, or, or maybe there's a lot of things going on with the kids, or, or whatever. Uh, we get disinterested, where, where our, our, the different things that we want in life are kind of at conflict. You see this happen a lot um, with married people with kids. Right, you go through the same routine every single day, and eventually, either the woman's going to say, "You know, I wish that our marriage had some spark to it," or the guy's going to say, "Man, I wish we did something fun every once in a while." Right? You guys have been married before, right? <laughs> you know what I'm talking about, right? Uh, you you get disinterested, um, or you get you get busy, and I uh, have their lost in schedules. So, especially if you have kids, you know, you have all these different activities throughout the week. You got work that you got to keep in mind, and then church has a bunch of stuff going on. So you got all this stuff going, on, and you just get tired. You know, you just get, get to a place of just being tired. And in that is where Jesus is telling us to be alert, in those situations. See, it's when we aren't aware that we need to be alert, that we need to be alert. See, Peter thought this was just another night. It was during a festival. No, nothing's going to happen during a Jewish festival. This is kind of the whole highlight of the year. This is the Passover. Surely, surely the Jews aren't going to try to do anything to Jesus on on this holy week, like that's not going to happen, <laughs> but they did, but they did, and so it was a time that they thought everything was going to be hunky dory, and it was not. Um, and and here's a here's a concept that I want you to get from this: is Peter, as well as us, we get this idea that it's just another day, you know. So whatever whatever's going to happen, I mean, eh, it's whatever. It's just another day. But here's the thing: it's never just another day. Every day is an opportunity. Every single one. The whole idea that it's just another day is something we imagine up in here. Let me try to say it a different way. Life is a bank account, and every day you're withdrawing money. Well, I, there's going to come a time when there's no more withdrawals to come. But what we do is we get stuck in a rut where every day is the same as another day, and we lose track of that, that our days are numbered. And so we kind of just go through the motions of, of, of the day, you know, the next day, and so on and so forth. What Peter should have done, and how that equals to us, prepare today like tomorrow depends on it. Every day that is today that you're alive, look to it thinking, I am preparing for tomorrow. 
Had Peter known he would have been in prayer, right? He would have been memorizing scripture. He, I mean, think about all the different things that you would have done if you were Peter and you knew that Jesus was about to get arrested and killed. Think of all, I mean, you would have all kinds of like plans and, 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 and you know, fail safes and all this different stuff. But problems come when we don't expect them, not when we do. Um, Dave Ramsey, he's a, he's a finance guy. He always talks about setting money aside so that when you have those uh-oh moments, because they always come, it won't be an uh-oh moment. It will be planned for. So your car breaks down. It doesn't come out of like your, your monthly bills. It comes out of the money that you've already set aside. And that's kind of the idea that we're looking at here. We should be in prayer and in scripture, especially when times are good and things are going well, so that we're prepared for when they're not. Because there's always another battle. I don't mean that in an ominous, you know, despair and woe kind of way. I mean that in a kind of way that there's always going to be something that happens. There's always going to be something that happens, you know. And uh, it's like this. They, they told my mom, they said this. If you get put on the list, have a bag ready to go. Because if, if we get somebody that you're a match for the, for the liver, like, you got to leave right now. Like, we call you and you leave right now. So you got to have a bag ready. Make sure your car always has gas, on, gas in it. It's kind of like that. You never know when you're going to get the call. So we usually treat each day like we have this unlimited pocket of time. I'll pray. What do we say about prayer? I'll pray more when I have more time, right? I mean, how, how many times have we said that? I'll pray more when I have more time. I just, I'm just too busy right now. I'll, 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 it's, it's not a big deal if I don't read the Bible every day. Like, I, I already read it yesterday, and I missed one day, not a big deal. You know, I'm not, I'm not looking at you guys and saying, oh, I'm, I'm saying we as people, this is our human nature. There's no such thing as, you know, oh, no, I don't struggle with that. That's just stupid. Everybody does. So, you know, you, you got to imagine if we get these things bored and distracted and all that stuff, you got to figure that maybe Peter was too. Maybe he lost his wow for who Jesus really was. You know, uh, we say, oh, I would never do that because this and that and another thing. But no, I, I think I think we make ourselves the heroes in the story. <laughs> So the idea here that I'm trying to get across, I'm going to say it in a different way. Stay alert in season and out of season. Whether it's the time for harvest or the time for sowing, you want to make sure that you're always ready for the harvest. Does that kind of make sense? You want to make sure that you're at the top of the game, even if you don't think there is a game. You know what I mean? I, I'm trying to say in like 14 different ways here. You want to make sure that you're always prepared for whatever trial comes your way. See, this is what happened. I started slacking off my Bible reading and all this different stuff. And then I get health problems that come, and I didn't have a well to draw from because I wasn't putting water into that well. See what I mean? And, yeah, God was gracious. I'm not trying to, like, you know, say that he, he somehow overlooked me or something stupid like that. But at the same time, if you prepare for something, it doesn't hit you as hard. I mean, think about the farmer who has, you know, some crops set aside versus the one who is not planning at all for his next season. I mean, it's just a completely different story. So there's something I want to point out here from that part that I just read you. And it's something that, uh, that Jesus says at the, at the end of that first part. He, he's praying. I mean, right before he goes and pray, uh, prays, he, he takes Peter and the two sons, and, and he says this to them. Excuse me. He says, my soul is overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death. And here we get to a specific request that Jesus makes to Peter and the two sons. He doesn't make it to all the 12 disciples. He says this specific request. Stay here and keep watch with me. Read through the Gospels and see how, how many times did Jesus make specific requests like this. Not a whole lot. I can't think of any off the top of my head. So... You know, this is something that's, that's, that should have been a red flag for Peter. You see, and it says very specifically that when he came, when he came back right here, it says, where is it? Uh, to, 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 to. He says that he said to Peter, I, I, didn't, I don't have this part written down, so I'll just, I'll just go back to it. It's right, right here. Right here, yeah. Yep, right there. Couldn't you men keep watch with me for one hour, he asked Peter. And so Peter, I, I really think that there's something going on here where he's trying to kind of warn Peter and prepare Peter for what's coming. Because remember, Jesus already knows he's going to deny him. He already told him that at the Last Supper, right? He's already talked to Peter a lot about what's coming. 
Remember, Peter, Peter said, oh, no, Lord, we'll never let that happen. And what does he say? Get behind me, Satan. Right? That was Peter that he was talking to. So he's already gone to great lengths, and Peter's still not getting it. And there's four specific things that Peter's not getting. We'll look at that at the end. But I just want you to focus on the fact that this is exactly what happens with us. It's the exact same pattern we see in us. Sometimes we read the Bible and we just kind of miss the forest for the trees. Like, oh, how does this apply to me? But this is, this is a story that so perfectly aligns with what happens in our own hearts and our own, in our own minds and spirits. You don't even have to work that hard to see how it applies. Here's another highlight here, okay? Jesus goes and prays. And it says that he came back. Now listen to this. He found them sleeping again, so he woke them up. No, no, he didn't. Look, look, look what it says. He again found them sleeping because their eyes were heavy, so he left them and went away. And there's something that I've noticed a lot. Let me say it like this. Jesus had more for them. Jesus had more to tell them, more to teach them. But they missed it because they were sleeping. Now, I, I personally feel like there's a direct correlation with how we work nowadays. We get spiritually asleep. And I'm not trying to make this a metaphor, and I'm not trying to dig deeper than what's there. I'm not trying to do all that. But this is the exact same pattern that we follow. You know, things will happen, especially when you get into ministry, like pastoring and stuff. It happens even more so, but it happens to everybody. We get spiritually asleep. And we start drifting and start having no goal in life and get kind of very unfocused. Like, what is the Christian life about? Where am I headed? Why am I doing this? You know, it, we, we, just, we just completely get off track. Uh, as Christians, as, as followers, as servants, we get off track. And we miss stuff when we do that because Jesus can't teach us something because we're asleep. You know what I mean? And I think that's one of the reasons why, why the Bible talks so much about us rousing ourselves to wake. You know, wake yourselves up, you know. And uh, so you see here that he comes back. Why did he come back to them? Not to wake them up. He came back to them to talk with them. They were asleep. So he went back. See how that works? And this is something I have never read. You know, I, I grew up in the church. We, I've read this story countless times. I had a read in the church when I was in there countless times. And I've never noticed that he came, saw them sleeping, and left. That, uh, this is a kind of a big point when you start to realize the pattern that Jesus is trying to tell Peter, and Peter is missing it time and time again. Yeah, I know, right? Right, and that's what I'm trying to get to is, excuse me. A, no, 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 you didn't cut me off. That's exactly what I'm saying is, is, you know, Jesus has more for us. But we get in that rut of, I'm fine. Nothing bad's happening. You know, it's okay if I slack off in my prayer, in my, going, in my reading the Bible, in my going to church, in my serving others, whatever it is. I, it, it doesn't matter. What it is. I'm, I'm not trying to make a laundry list of, like, things you have to do to be the perfect Christian. That's not what I'm getting at at all. I'm trying to, trying to show the different things that, like, God speaks to us in, and when we kind of just back off, we miss that, and it's a really important lesson. So there are, are there are four things I'm going to mention that, that I think really kind of elaborate on this whole spiritual sleep thing. The first thing is you know that you're spiritually asleep when you're not interested in the things of God. You have zero interest for it, be it the Bible, be it seeing people saved, be it lives being turned around. Um, I mean, I've seen a lot of Christians who drug addicts will come into the house. Sorry, dr drug addicts will come into the church, you know, and they'll be set free, and they won't even be interested. Like, okay, but you need to stop wearing those kinds of clothes in the church. Completely miss that somebody just got saved. You know, and, and, and I, I've seen it all my life, and I've seen it in me. And it comes so slowly. The problem is, is that we think, Spiritual sleep is something that comes all of a sudden, and we think that it's something that we choose to do. More often than not, it's just just drifting, just a day-by-day -day drift. That, that's more often than not what it is. You know, you make a bunch of soft choices, like, I'm tired, so today I'm not going to read the Bible. And then it becomes tomorrow, too, and then, you know what I mean? It just starts 
it was just snowballing. That's the word, snowballing. So we become not interested in the things of God. Like, if God does it, like, I don't, I don't really care. Like, okay, yeah, like, a miracle for Susan, hooray, you know, whatever. You know, we, or we're just not really interested in seeing miracles anymore. We're not, we're not interested in seeing people's life change. We're not involved in growing the kingdom. We, it, it's about my bank account. It's about my desires, my life being for me to have fun. I've gone through enough suffering and hardship. I should get a little piece of the pie now. I mean, we all go through times like that, guys. I'm, I'm, it happens to all of us. I, when you get older, something happens where I'm not young and a fool anymore. I need the time to just kind of relax a little bit. You know, I'm working hard. That was from when I was a kid. Another thing we do is when we have kids, you know, okay, well, you know, I founded a good house, and, you know, now it's just kind of on its own to keep itself going, you know. Uh, I, I know I went through that when I first got married. You know, I, I wanted to keep God first. God was going to be the center of everything. We are going to have daily devotionals and all this kind of great ideas, great plans. And then you get married, and th they kind of start to drift off a little bit, and then you start having kids, and it's like, okay, well, the whole nightly devotional thing, that's out the door. We got to do the whole toothbrushing thing and, you know, that thing. You know, and you just little steps like that, and it becomes where you just get caught up in life as though this life is all there is. And what makes it harder, I think, is that our culture is super saturated with the idea of live for today. You know what I mean? And it's hard to be in something like that all the time and not constantly rouse yourself awake, especially if you're not reading the Bible, which, once again, gets to be one of those things where it becomes cumbersome. You know, we have God's Word that applies to our life today, and we just get too tired to read it. You know, we just, eh. Yeah, yeah, God, I want to know your will for my life. I want to hear from you, but I don't really want to have time to read the Bible because I don't really have time to read the Bible. You know what I mean? And 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 I, I'm not trying to make anybody feel stupid. I'm just saying how we tend to operate. Uh, so uh, we, we get where we don't really become involved in people being saved. It's just another person. It, it doesn't really matter all that much. Um, we get where we're just not an encouraging person. We're tearing people down. We're gossiping. We're complaining. We're nitpicking. We're going from thing to thing. We're just pulling back from everybody. I don't want. To, I just want to be alone. I don't want. To, I don't want people to know me. I don't. See what I mean? And we get constantly in this place of like, it, it's more. It's less and less encouraging them, and more and more. I gotta watch out for me, you know. And you start getting into this almost like it's almost like a turf war. You know what I mean? Have you ever worked at a business where it's like a turf war? Everybody has to like stand their ground and like really validate themselves to their boss because it's like a super hostile work environment. The same thing happens in the church, too, um, especially as we kind of start to get to the spiritual sleep stage. And uh, I want to point out what the ES, how the ESV words, um, verse 45 specifically. In, in the NIV, which is the one I read it from, it says this. <clears throat> Excuse me. Sorry. It says this in the NIV. He again found them sleeping because their eyes were heavy, so he left them. Oh, I'm sorry, that's not what it says. Uh, let me write here. Um, are you still sleeping and resting? Look, the hour has come, and the Son of Man ha is delivered into the hands of sinners. Rise, let us go. Here comes my betrayer. And in the ESV, it says this. Sleep and take your rest later on. Instead of, are you still resting and sleeping? I actually think the ESV is, is probably more accurate. I think that this is what is trying to be said in Matthew. Sleep and take your rest later on. We've got work right now. Which, And here's the thing I want you to get. I, I don't think he was chewing them out. I think that he was trying to show them something that they just weren't getting. You know what I mean? Could have been. Right. And you could be right. But thankfully for what I'm saying, it doesn't really um, change what I'm saying. But that's an interesting thought. I mean, we really don't know. So maybe you're right. Who knows? Um, th there's two things that I want you to get from this verse specifically, this part of this verse, sleep and take your rest later on. First off, there's a time for sleep and rest. You don't have to work yourself to the bone. But we have to be prepared. Okay, so yes, sleep, take your rest. God's not saying you have to like constantly be, you know, rah, 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 rah. I mean, you see pastors try to do this all the time. They keep their phones on all the time. They're always, they're always with people, always working. That's, you burn yourself out. Like you can't do that. Like you have to take time to be alone, time to have prayer, time for your family. The a pastor's greatest ministry is to his wife and kids. If he puts the church in front of his wife and kids, the church is going to fail because how, it, how a pastor treats his wife and kids is always mirrored in how he treats the congregation, always. 
Always. That's one of the reasons why Paul talks about, you know, look at how it's to see if somebody is qualified for pastor. See how they treat their kids. Did they treat them with dignity? And this is in uh, Timothy. And that's one of the things, one of the stipulations he has for pastoral ministry is look at how he treats his, his kids. And uh, so, you, so you see this kind of pattern. So, yes, absolutely sleep and rest. Everybody needs sleep and rest. Jesus slept and rested. And I'm not trying to say you need to work yourself raw. But we have to be prepared. See, this is, what, this is what your day should always look like. Task number one, prayer in the Bible. Whatever else happens, task number one, prayer in the Bible. That has to be the foundation of your entire day. And the more that is the foundation of your entire day, the, the more the rest falls into line. If you're really reading the Bible, you're going to know that right after that step comes the second step, family. And then work. And when you do your work, you know that you're giving your 110% effort to it, right? Because you're doing it as if you were doing it to the Lord. So yes, you're absolutely doing that. But if you're choosing favorites, it's always going to be God, family, work. Always in that order. And when you get that part of your day kind of moved out of order, that's when you start having problems. Because what happens? You get up, you instantly go to work. You don't have your time with God. God becomes a compromise. Work becomes an immovable object. God becomes a compromise. Then when you get back from, back from work, of course you're going to be too tired because now your family is scrounging for their time with you because you were too busy. So they try to squeeze as much time in, so the, the time that you have time to read, you're too tired, and you try to read, it just doesn't even make sense anymore. You're like, oh, what? So luckily, though, here in this day and age, see, America's kind of set, it up, self, set itself up for failure because we live by such a tight schedule all the time. It's called being monochronistic. You know, if I say I'm going to be there at 7, I better be there at 7. In Africa, they don't have this problem because they don't say I'll be there at 7. They'll say I'll be there in the morning, and that could be anywhere from 5 to 11. They're, it's called polychronistic. It's, they're just they're polychronic. Uh, they're just not really that into, you know, and so now that we have our lives like this, you know, it's harder and harder for us to time, find, find time to put it where it needs to go. That explains the cable company. They're African, so they go by the tribal system, and you're American, so you're going by the, by the American system. Um, I hope that didn't sound racist, because I did not mean that as racist at all, but we're live streaming, so now I'm thinking it might have sounded racist. Goodness sakes. Anyways, so, you know, the idea is that, 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 that we have to be prepared. That, that, that's the idea. That I want. And then the second thing that I want to, get, want to point out from this verse, for Peter on this night... Jesus being arrested was essential. That was important to Peter. But prayer and keeping watch with Jesus was not essential. Do you know how you know? Because Peter was sleeping when he should have been watching and praying, and he had his sword out when Jesus was getting arrested. So he understood then that it was important, but he didn't understand that that time of prayer and watching was just as important. See, and, 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 and that's what we do. We think if I'm not being productive in this moment right now, which is, this is Paul all over. If I'm not being productive in this moment right now, the point, the, the, the day is its own. It doesn't matter. See, but that's what I'm trying to say. It's not just the times when something's happening that something is happening. Also, when things aren't happening, things are happening. It's like this. We say, oh, God, you're moving. God is, is moving right now. Just because you don't see it doesn't mean he's not moving. It's the exact same way. It's not what you see that makes reality. It's what is. Excuse me. So let's look at, excuse me, sorry about that. Uh, Matthew 26, 51 says, Peter, or it actually says he, but I changed it to Peter so you know who he was. Peter drew his sword and struck the servant of the high priest and cut off his ear. So, here we see Jesus getting arrested, and Peter still is completely oblivious to what is going on. So then in verses 69 through 75, I'm not going to read the whole thing. I've just kind of uh, taken out key parts and shortened it to about a verse or two worth, it, worth of it. You also were with Jesus the Galilean. The, the, Peter is wait, Jesus is going in for his trial, and Peter is outside the gate just kind of hanging out, just waiting to see what happens. And people keep coming up to him saying stuff like this. You were also with Jesus the Galilean. Hey, I think you were, you were with that Nazarene guy. 
He denied it with, now, now listen, to how, listen to how he progresses here. The first time, Peter denied it before them all. Okay, I don't know him. The second time, he denied it with an oath. I swear to you, I did not know him. Now we get to the third, the third time. And from what I understand, Peter denied Jesus more than three times. But it's only recorded in each one, three, the most of three times in each one. So however you want to say that. Uh, and then the third time he says, he went out. I'm sorry, I skipped a line. He began to invoke a curse on himself and to swear. First, you're just, no, I don't know him. Then it was, I swear to you, I don't know him. Now, he is invoking a curse and swearing. He got serious. He got his, his fighting gloves out. So you see this progression, and you see that Peter is still not getting it. You can know that he's not getting it because he went from rebuking Jesus that, hey, no, you shouldn't go and die, to then falling asleep when he's supposed to be watching, to then cutting off a guy's ear, <laughs> to then denying that he even knows the guy that he was cutting off the ear on behalf of, <laughs> and then finally, the, the highlight of it, he went out and whipped, wept bitterly. He knows that something bad is happening, and he just he can't figure out how he got to where he is. He just can't figure it out. <laughs> so shortly after this, Peter became one of the top leaders of the church. He was the head of the church. After, after Jesus was gone, Peter was, Peter was like one of the top dogs of the church. Everybody knew Peter. Hey, okay? It's Peter. <laughs> and, and, and what I want you to get from that is our greatest failures can, can, can happen before our greatest callings. And I would even say it a little bit differently. I would say our greatest callings from God can't happen until our greatest failures. I am convinced that our pride is so great that until we have tasted the sting of defeat, God cannot possibly do anything with us because we just got too much, too much. There's too much of us there to work with. I'm reminded of in, in Judges, there's a story where this guy Gideon is raising an army to fight the enemies of God. And he's, God says this to Gideon, he says, you have too many soldiers. And I think that there's a, there's a line in each of our lives where we have to cross it between where we believe in God, I'm sorry, yeah, believe in God, oh, I believe in God, to where we cross the line and we start believing God. See what I mean? We have to cross the line of believing in God, oh, yeah, God's out there somewhere, I, I, I know the Bible, did it. So we, he takes us past this field of, of pain, a really nasty experience, and once we get past that pain and we've had our failure, then we start to we then we start to really be able to believe God. You are who you say you are. It happened to Job. It happened to Abraham. It happened to Moses. You see it happening time and time and, and time again where God really can't use people until they're broken. Paul, super qualified guy, super qualified, but he's killing the, he's killing all the Christians. Oh, well, that's that's not good. You can't have a minister who's killing people. <laughs> I mean, by show of hands, who would have a pastor in their church who was going out killing people? Probably not, huh? Okay, so what does Paul have to do? He has to completely cripple the guy before he can make him what he is. And now he wrote all these books in the New Testament, and well, now we have this, this, this record and this, you know, super important books. But without that failure, we wouldn't have had the books. So it's one of those things. And, 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 and I think the reason why that is is because God makes much out of little. And I'm not talking about making mounds out of molehills. That's not what I'm talking about. I, I'm talking about God uses the simplest and stupidest and most basic things to do the biggest things. I mean, think about this. You have God, infinite, all-knowing, all-powerful. And he makes himself a human. Think about this. All-powerful God making himself like us. God makes much out of little. So you see Peter, a complete screw-up. This guy is a fisherman. He's not educated. You can tell because he wrote Second Peter all by himself. He wrote it by his own hand. 
and the Greek is just, it's atrocious. It is. Out of all the New Testament, I believe it's probably the worst written Greek. It's hard, to, it's hard to translate it sometimes, guys, because it's just like, what on earth are you saying, Paul? All right, Peter. He wasn't educated. He was a fisherman. He wasn't rich. He wasn't the, the, the cream of the crop. And then to make it out worse, this is, it's always him who's getting in trouble. It's always him who's shooting off his mouth. You know, at least the sons of Zebedee, they had their mom go and whine to Jesus. But Peter was the one doing it all himself all the time. He's always contradicting Jesus, shooting his mouth off, cutting people's ears off. You know, this is a guy that's just not getting the message. And uh, what a screw up. But he becomes one of the leaders of the church. And what a powerful message. So this shows us Peter's disconnect from Jesus. Now let's look at Peter's disconnect. This is the last thing we're looking at. So first off, let's kind of summarize the events here. He rejected Jesus foretelling his death. Jesus said, hey, I'm going to go to Jerusalem. I'm going to die. And Peter says, get behind. And he says, no, 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 Jesus, let it not be so. And Jesus says, get behind me, Satan. You don't know what you're talking about. So then we get to this next thing. His next, oh, I don't know why I did that. It was supposed to go one by one, but, you know, hey, we all make mistakes. Uh, he didn't stay awake when God, Jesus specifically told him a specific request from Jesus. Wait with me. Watch. He cut off the servant's ears. When he, you can you just imagine him waking up. Uh, yeah, I know, Jesus. I was just resting my eyes. Oh, I'm my sword. Uh, you can just imagine the comic, like, half-asleep Peter. You know, he, he almost comes across like a dope in the story. You know, which gives me a lot of comfort because I feel like a dope half the time. You know, so I mean, hey, if God can use a dope like him, I guess I'm not half sunk, you know. Uh, so he cut off the servant's ears, and then he, he, he denies even knowing Jesus after that. I mean, how are you going to bounce back from that? Oh, that wasn't me that cut off that guy's ear. I, I don't even know him. I bet you there was a splatter of blood on his cloak or something like that. He's like, oh, no, that's not mine. <laughs> you didn't... <laughs> yeah, you know, we were having a festival over and... Uh... Uh, I'm a little turned around and got a little tipsy, I guess. <laughs> uh, you should see the other guy. Uh, anyways, and so here's what Peter didn't understand. When, Jesus, when Peter rejected Jesus for telling his death, you can see that Peter didn't understand Jesus' vision. And you might say, okay, well, what's, what's vision? Well, what are you talking about? Jesus came for a reason to do a task. That's the vision. Jesus' vision was seeing people get saved. He was looking into the future for the purpose of his coming. He had a plan. That's vision. Leaders have it when they're able to take their organizations into new, uh, new centuries, re re completely reorganize themselves and reinvent themselves. Have you ever, guys, guys ever seen a company rebrand themselves? They came out with a new logo. They came out stronger than before. Harley Davidson did it. They, they were having a monster dive off, and, and my grandpa ended up buying stock for it. He's like, I think they're going to have a comeback. And they did. You know, and they, they, they took off again. And that's kind of what I'm talking about, vision for the future. Jesus wasn't being stolen against his will. He didn't need somebody to defend him. He wasn't being stolen. He wasn't being kidnapped. He came for a task, and he was surrendering himself for the task. Peter didn't get that. He didn't have the vision of Jesus. Peter didn't understand Jesus' vision. Jesus knew and was submitted to the process of death. He knew what was happening, and he was submitted to the process of death. This is what I came for. That's the whole reason why I was praying in the Garden of Gethsemane. He was preparing for what he was about to do. Like, he understood what was happening. It was like, oh, well, I'm completely, what are these people doing here? Why are you greeting me, Judas? Like, no, he, he understood what was going on. So then the second thing that Peter didn't get, Peter's disconnect from Jesus, he didn't understand the hour. And I think this is, these are both things that we oftentimes get. We, we lose the vision. W what is Jesus wanting to do in the world? I don't know. I know that there's this thing that I want. And I'm saving up my money so I can get that thing that I want. See how we think? Then the hour, we also don't understand the hour. We are on the doorsteps of the end of time. <laughs> and we're still living for ourselves. <laughs> like, you got to wonder <laughs> wh wh how much bad things have to do before we finally admit, hey, we really need to get right with God. <laughs> I mean, look at, look at the movies that they're making. Everybody knows it's the end. 
They're talking about signs in the heavens. They're everybody's making movies about the end times, about an apocalypse, about zombies and all this different stuff. Why? Because everybody knows it. You can just look outside and know that the end is coming. You've got fires lighting up half the country. You've got wars and rumors of wars. You've got sickness spreading like crazy. What else do you want to happen before you finally admit, hey, we might be at, right at the threshold of hell here? So he, Paul, Peter also didn't understand the hour. Jesus was about to die, and he's sleeping. Trials were coming. Very serious temptations were coming. And he's cutting off somebody's ear. He's just completely oblivious to the hour that he's living in. There's a this, there's this story of this missionary. If I don't tell it now, I'm going to forget it. There's a story of this missionary. He goes to this, um, to this South American uh, tribe uh, to, to preach the gospel to them, and they end up killing him. So his wife goes back and keeps doing the mission. And she said this. She said, it's not me in a different set of circumstances. It's Christ in me. And what I'm trying to get here is she understood the hour. It was the hour for those natives to get saved. It was, it was the hour for those tribals to hear about Jesus. It, it was the time. You see what I mean? But most of us go through life as though it's kind of a picnic, and we have no idea what we're even doing. It's not about building heavenly wealth. It's just kind of about staying alive, especially COVID hit, and everybody's just focusing on survival. Tomorrow was coming, but Peter wasn't ready. Then also there's an obvious statement that he didn't understand the hour. He wasn't going to live forever. But what, do we, what happens when we're young, right? I'm young. You guys are old. It'll never happen to me. Uh, and especially nowadays, we live in such an age of disillusionment. We got kids, I'm just going to work out, so I'm not going to get sick like my grandparents did. And it's like, okay, <laughs> all right. <laughs> You're right. You got it all figured out. Your grandparents, they're just a bunch of idiots. Your parents, they're stupid. You, you got it all figured out. You go for it. Uh, another thing that, that Peter didn't understand was the motivation. Peter's third area of disconnect from Jesus was that he didn't understand Jesus' motivation. He didn't understand that it was an issue of God's heart. God's heart for people. God is in control, and that wasn't changing. We don't have to seize control. We don't have to, oh, if I don't hold on, then nobody will be here to hold on. We have to trust and obey, for there's no other way to be happy in Jesus but to trust and obey. That's, that's what's going on. And so we have to know God's motivation, but also we have to know our motivation. And I just search our heart and allow God to search our heart. What is really my motivation? Am I here for, for why? I know a lot of people who were going to church simply because it's just what they did on Sundays. And then COVID hit, and they realized, hey, I don't actually have to go to church. And so they stopped going to church, and they said, you know, I actually like my life better without church. Because it wasn't something they were obeying God, seeking God, trying to build relationships, trying to build the kingdom. No, it was just another thing to do, like going to baseball practice or, you know, a, a Sunday afternoon nap. It wasn't something of substance. They didn't have Jesus' motivation. They didn't understand Jesus' motivation, and they themselves did not have Jesus' motivation. So then the fourth Peter thing Peter didn't understand, the fourth area of disconnect between Jesus and, 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 and Peter, was Peter didn't understand the cost. He didn't get that. You can tell that because when push came to shove, he started thinking, what if they arrest me too? He's outside waiting for Jesus' trial, and they're like, hey, weren't you with me? He's like, I might get arrested if I don't play my cards right. I don't know. I mean, what would you do in a situation like that? You see somebody getting arrested, you don't want to go to jail, you know? Uh, and so you just like, yeah, this, you know, it's like, it's like when they catch you. My, my brother always said this back when he was doing drugs when I was a kid. Um, he always said this, even if they catch you with it on you, you always deny, deny, <laughs> deny. <laughs> okay. <laughs> but anyways, um, well, I, I'm not a weird religious person, you know, that it's just not for me, you know. The whole, I'm not, I'm not like one of those Bible thumper weirdos, you know. I, I've got a life, you know. I'll, I, I, okay, God's there, you know, and God wants me to, you know, go to the, go to church, whatever, and I'll go like every once in a while, whatever, but I'm not like one of those weird people, you know. And so we get in this area where we're, we're not really getting the cost. And everybody comes to, comes to this place 
I hear so many times people who say this, I used to believe in God, but then this happened. So I only believe in God so long as the things that I want happen. They didn't understand the cost. This is why Jesus tells us beforehand to count the cost. You know, make sure you understand what you're doing. He doesn't say get them saved no matter what the cost. He, he, he actually takes a different tactic. Make sure you're not lying to them. This isn't going to be like, you know, fairies and rainbows and stuff. Like, th this is going to be for real. Like, they need to know what they're getting into. You know, hey, so yeah, you know, make sure you understand the cost. You have to die daily. And it's like, whoa, 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 let's calm down with that. <laughs> You know, I've been in the hospital before. That doesn't sound like something I want to do every day. And uh, so we believe in Jesus until we suffer. Something I don't like happens. Life doesn't go my way. My child dies. Now all of a sudden I have an excuse to be mad at God. Now I don't have to worship God because something unfair happened. Something Chuck said in, in a sermon I'll never forget. He said, everybody's going to die. It doesn't make God unfair if a bunch of people die at the exact same time like a tsunami right wipes out a whole village how could god let this happen well hold on hold on they were all going to die anyways being alive is terminal being alive is a terminal illness that ends in death every time there's no such thing as being alive without eventually being dead okay so now that we've gotten over that little hump there it's all right we, we know the guy at the end of the game it's all right all right, we know who's handing out the trophies. <laughs> it's okay. <laughs> we're we're going to be okay. So now that takes us to our levels of disconnect. And I, I think that we aren't prepared for the trials that come at us tomorrow. Because today we are disconnected from Jesus in these four areas. First off, we don't understand the vision. Where are you going? Where are you going? And I'm not looking for answers. I just want you guys to think about these questions. Where am I going? What, what am I striving for? What, what, what's the end game here? When will I know that I've actually gotten there? Most of us have no idea in life. We don't have a vision for our life. How will I know when I've succeeded at my vision? Most of us don't even have a vision, so how can we possibly know when we've gotten there? <laughs> you know, does it align with God? And be real with yourself. Is your vision to make as much money as possible before you die? Be honest with yourself. You're only lying to yourself. What is your motivation? You can't fix it if you're not being real with it. So, so, so know your vision and make sure that it is aligned and submitted to God's vision. Singing off the hour. What's coming? What can you do with your life? You don't, your time, time is not an, an endless well. Eventually, you're going to run out of money at the bank. What are you building? It's, it's not up to you to decide what time you are born into. It's up to you to decide what to do with the time that you have. So what are you going to do with the time that you have? Understand the hour of your life. Third, the motivation. Why do we bother? Why are you going to church? Why bother with that? Well, so I can, you know, please God. Okay, well, why bother pleasing God? Ask the real questions and let your heart be bothered by what you find there. Because in nowadays, we have this idea that our heart is basically pure. And, you know, you just have to search and search for the answers. That's hogwash. If you look inside for answers, you're going to keep on looking till the day you die. And inside your heart is not pure. Inside of your heart is evil. Why do people commit adultery? Because we want to. Why do we people get, get into porn? Because we want to and it feels good. Why do we do drugs? Because we want to and it feels good. Like it isn't rocket science. We are at our core evil. That's why we need a savior to set us free. Like, if we were good on enough by ourselves, and oh, I'm just a pretty good citizen, but you're still evil before God. <laughs> like, what does it matter how good of a citizen you are if you're evil before God? <laughs> it doesn't make sense. So why do we bother? What is your real motivation? You know, I, I, I think about this, this cartoon I watched once, and uh, th this, this guy was supposed to do a line, for like a, a scene or something. He's like, but what's my motivation? He's like, you're ordering a sandwich because you're hungry. That's your motivation. It was just really funny. <laughs> Anyways, uh, and then the fourth thing, the cost. Most of us have not come to terms with the cost. See, when I was a kid, it, oh, this was easy. God, my life is yours. Whatever you want, I'll go wherever you want. Do whatever you want. Send me, you know, all my life. You know, oh, yeah, great, great aspirations, by the way. Great things to pray. And I thought I meant it until I got older. You start realizing that 
your time is going by. You're getting older. You're not staying a kid. Things start hurting that used to not hurt. <laughs> and then bad things started happening. People started treating you bad when you didn't deserve it. Loved ones started dying when you weren't ready for it. You, you got to a place where, you know, you, you don't really even know what is going on. Like, where am I headed in life? You know, you get to a place and you just, you, you, you don't get it. You, can, you, you don't understand the cost. But this is a good thing. When those times come and you seriously doubt your faith and you seriously doubt, your, doubt God that even exists or that even hears or cares, that's the best place to be in because now you can actually make a real decision even without the answers, I'm going to serve you. Even if things are going to go like this, I'll still do what you want. And now you can, you can go through the crossroads and things can really change. It's easy to be a young, you know, young, arrogant person who thinks that they know everything. It's hard. It's hard to watch your strength and your dreams die and still have bigger things that you do tomorrow. And that's, that's why we got to stay in the Word and stay in prayer. Because for some of us, for many of us, we are in our Garden of Gethsemane right now. Everything's going fine right now. It would be really easy to back off and take a nap. It really would. But th there's things you have to pray and watch for. Raising grandkids. These are important things. Possibly the most important thing that will at least happen in this stage of your life. Yeah. And, and, and also the most important. A foundation is being laid that would not have been laid except for you. These are important days. The days that you are living in are important days for the kingdom, for you. Don't miss the chance because you're tired or, or you're distracted. Remember that your life is passing and there's more important things. Stay in the word and stay in prayer so you can be prepared when the betrayal comes, when the, when the temptations and the trials come. That's, that's the whole thing we're working towards. Make sure you have vision. You know where you're going. You, have, you know what the hour is. You, you, you know what is coming and what can be done. You, you know your motivation. Why are you bothering? And you know the cost. How far and how long are you agreeing to go?